Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. We're going to talk about are we paying enough attention to Latin America? So many Latin American countries are on the fringe that we need to know more about them. Our guest for this show is our geopolitical analyst, Rupmati Kandakar. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Jay. Thank you for having me on your show. And always, always my pleasure, Jay. In the little reading I've done on Latin America, I find it, it's really, it's a strange place in the global south. Um, there are so many problems about it. There's so many issues that have been unresolved. And uh, we don't hear that much about it. We hear about Venezuela and Maduro um, because that's a raw meat story. It'll go on because it's, you know, it's so shocking to the conscience, if you will. But there's a lot of other shocking to the conscience things that have happened and are happening um, just across our southern border. And we hear about, um, you know, the border wall and the people coming through the Darien Gap uh, from, from Latin America. But, but, the, but the reality is we're not really caring about them. We're not really paying attention, in my opinion. So why don't you start with discussing what happened in Venezuela? Where does Venezuela fit? It's a very poor country. It's a country that's under the thumb of Nicolas Maduro. Um, what happened? What is happening? What will happen in Venezuela? Yeah, Jay, uh, Venezuela is in the news and uh, we have the election uh, crisis over there where, uh, you know, uh, Venezuela has cut diplomatic ties with uh, seven countries, Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, Pure, uh, Peru, Panama, the Dominican Republic and Uruguay, citing interventionist acts. So the uh, running president does not want the president-elect to come into power. So that's the scenario, Jay, and that is leading to civil unrest. You have uh, Saddam-style uh, the statues uh, being uh, brought down in the streets. You know, that is a, a scene we imagine in a conflict in the Middle East. But you have something happening in Latin America is bringing back old memories over there, right? So, uh, Jay, when, uh, just to start uh, our Latin American uh, discussion, that like, there are 33 countries in Latin America. And I think uh, for us, Latin on a superficial level would just mean music, <laughs> the language, and uh, uh, some, you know, Chigo era, you know, you have Cuba, you have the cigars, and these superficial things. Nobody has gone to the depth of what Latin America is. And that is where it comes as one of another continent, which we had discussed before, was as the forgotten continent was Africa. And one other continent which comes to picture is now Latin America. Tell us about the geography, Rupmati. There we have a huge, uh, you know, the uh, connecting uh, line between uh, the Northern American continent and the Southern American continent, which has this group of uh, countries and, you know, famous for the drug cartels and, you know, for uh, the Swiss Canal, then we come down to Brazil, then Argentina, then the side Chile, Peru. These things, you know, these, um, the vast, uh, distant, uh, vast seed of vastness of Latin America is what brings these countries, you know, into oblivion. It's a paradox which they exist in. As much as they're huge, they have disappeared onto the uh, international scene. We don't hear more of them. What I was interested in hearing from you uh, is the, the crime, the violence, the danger for tourism, and therefore the very, very uh, you know, troubled tourism industries there, the corruption, um, the foreign interference, which somehow feeds into all of that, including U.S. diplomatic mistakes over the years since the yeah. Monroe Doctrine in 1823, the resulting poverty, the lack of collaborations between these countries. They really don't talk to each other and collaborate on things. The fact that they have very rich resources like oil, and that's a magnet for intervention by the Chinese and the Russians, um, and the instability that results from that, the revolutions and further revolutions and dictatorships like in Venezuela. And, um, you know, I, all things considered, it's doesn't seem that they're developing at the same rate as the U.S., for sure, or Europe, or really any other place as large with such population and resources in the world. They're way behind the curve. Why? 
Yeah, Jay, uh, absolutely right. Jay, if we, you know, it's a hodgepodge of uh, um, many factors in Latin America. And so that brings us, uh, you know, it, it, it makes compulsory for us to analyze it also on such a superficial level. So we start from the statistics, Jay, that um, uh, Latin America has 14% of the world's population and 21% of the world's GDP as a combined whole. Okay, now uh, Latin America's importance comes uh, um, to uh, consideration for China and Russia. Why? Because of three factors. First, it's proximity to North America. You know, they can control and dictate from the backyard of the United States. That is what appeals to them the most. That is, you know, you cannot uh, deny that. Then the second reason why uh, America and Europe uh, try to bring in Latin America because it's a country which has values. Majority countries are democracies. So uh, that kind of spread of democracy, spread of globalization, spread of liberal values is what appeals to the United States and to Europe. So these two different, different factors. And third is the role that Latin America plays in climate change. Now, like you know, Amazon uh, forest that they have is is considered to be the lungs of the earth. So uh, they do play an important proactive role in any climate change which affects the entire globe. So they are not peripheral in that, that area. They have to be preserved, the resources have to be preserved. Um, tribals in the Amazon, uh, tribal indigenous people in the mountains, they also do form a part of this you know, uh, preservation module. But climate change and preserving the Brazilian forest is which is of utmost importance to the world. So that comes first, first. And then they do have resources. They do have lithium, they, they have copper, they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, soya beans, agricultural uh, produces on a high over there. So, Jay, if you go to see that uh, by 2050, Latin America is only the only one which demography is moving outwards immigration outwards. We have immigrants which are coming into United States and uh, Europe and these places, but Latin America is going outwards. So they will have a resource, uh, human resource issue, say by 2050 is the uh, time. And third, uh, most important factor is, Jay, uh, their presence in international forums, their voting power in international forums. Like in the UN, they almost come up to uh, a chunk, uh, one third majority of, you know, if you want to vote, you can get the uh, Latin American bloc on your side. So, uh, Jay, there were, you know, on the Ukraine issue, if you say, there were six uh, UN issues, uh, important resolutions that were passed, and Latin America has held a neutral stand in this. So, uh, to woo Latin America for voting and uh, is a big task because all these countries, like you said, they don't have coherence in their policies. They do act differently. And getting them together to act as a block is difficult. And Brazil is very uh, individualistic and it's part of the BRICS also. So uh, it takes, and it wants a permanent seat in the United uh, Nations uh, Security Council because of a representative of Latin America. So there is a selfish attitude also that comes into some of the uh, strong Latin American countries. And Jay, this is where China comes in. And China's hold on Latin America is so, uh, what do you say? Um, can I use the word venomous? <laughs> it's it, because uh, they have, they are the second largest trading partner of the United, United States uh, of Latin America. But uh, Jay, the thing is that their, their trade has increased 26-fold, from around $12 billion to $315 billion. So you can imagine the kind of... And uh, Latin America is not even a priority of uh, China. The thing is that they use... They are uh, sourcing their resource, raw materials for their manufacturing industry from Latin America. This is the importance that they're giving to Latin America as a raw material source. And, Jay, by 2035, it's not far away, 
it's very close. They're targeting to 700 billion, that is doubling it. So uh, my point is, Jay, that the United States is uh, uh, falling behind. If you say in the 2022 economic uh, um, get together of all these nations, when the FTAs, that is the free trade agreements had to be decided, the United States boycotted uh, Cuba, uh, Ecuador, uh, Chile, Uruguay, um, on the basis that they did not have democratic setups, okay? It was a trade agreement. So uh, it was necessary to bypass this political maneuvering and to bring them all together under the U U.S. umbrella. That is where China comes in. And over the past two decades, Jay, China has invested $160 billion in just uh, infrastructure in Latin America. And 20 Latin American nations are part of the Chinese Belt and uh, Road Initiative, BRI. So uh, Jay, just check it. What happens at the same time? Uh, the US proposes to give 617 million to these nations that works out to $20 million each. So see the disparity between what the US, uh, uh, you know, considers uh, Latin America or China tries to hold grab Latin America. So the U.S. has a competing rival in Latin America. What was considered, we had lethargy in our foreign policy regarding Latin America. It was like they are here, they are with us, where will they go? What has happened, China has come in and they are trying to take over these places through infrastructure. Whenever a country comes in for infrastructure development, Jay, they get a hold within the country. So that is the danger of China lurking in the backyard over here. With that, they can control immigration. They can control the resources. They can control the trade routes. You know, the Suez Canal has a um, very substantial chunk of uh, international trade that passes through. And if China starts controlling these nations, they do also get a, a second uh, hand hold on drug, the drug cartel, oil resources. Where is this all? These are very important considerations. The United States foreign policy has to bypass some, make some political allowances to bring together this chunk under our fold. Because it's very important uh, for the future. It has potential. That is the issue. You know, I would add to that list of concerns that uh, China can establish the, uh, military bases uh, yeah. through its connections with all these countries in, in Latin America. So, right. I mean, it's, it's really very threatening because they're way ahead of us and we're way behind. And, and what makes it worse, and I would like to explore this with you, is this whole thing about the border and stopping people from immigrating. The fact is that 18, maybe 20 percent of the population of the United States is Latino. It's right. huge. We, we yes. are, in large part, a, a function of Latin America and of Latino people. So, I mean, for us to have this anti-Latino border thing is really Looney Tunes. And it's not, it didn't start with Trump, although he certainly exacerbated it, trying to build a wall and all that. Um, the fact is, we've, we've had bad policy toward them year after year, decade after decade. You know, the Monroe Doctrine, 1823, was a joke, and it's been a joke ever since. Um, we never really paid attention to them, even though our, they're our next-door neighbor. And even though the possibilities, as you say, are enormous. I mean, for example, we haven't invested enough. They could be a, a tremendous trading partner, manufacturing partner, resource partner. We haven't, we haven't made them that. We could make them that. And as a result, their economies are uh, in tatters. Their governments are in tatters. Their social services and their society in general is in tatters, leading to all that violence and, and gang operation and drug operation um, and danger. I mean, I, you know, it used to be, I, I have the impression that back in the 30s, um, maybe the 30s and 40s and 50s, there was some tourism going on in Latin America, American tourism. But I doubt it's much now because the chances of you getting kidnapped 
um, or killed uh, or you know, robbed in every which way, held for ransom, uh, is, is much greater. Those possibilities are much greater now. So, um, you know, anybody who's planning a trip is going to plan a trip to a, a more secure area. Joe Biden followed Trump in terms of trying to stop migration. But the United States, over many years, has failed to address the root causes of that, you know, wish to migrate. It's failed to address the, the problems in Latin America. It's failed to be a good neighbor. It's failed to invest and care about the people, even though we have an enormous number of Latinos in the country. Why don't we care? It's clear that we don't care. In fact, just the other way, we, we treat them as negative people, people who are rapists and murderers and what have you. And in fact, all they're trying to do is escape a, a terrible society in a number of those countries. There's only one or two of them where, you know, it's, it's, it's got a decent civil society, but most of the others are dangerous and failed states. What are we going to do? Group Mahdi, we have a long way to go before this country straightens itself out on Latin America. What kind of changes would you make to foreign policy for these countries? Hey, follow the path of copy the Chinese. The Chinese are big copycats. You have to copy the Chinese. Go for the infrastructure development. Bring them into free trade agreements. Uh, uh, bring human resource back. They have more cultural affinity with the United States rather than the other uh, illegal immigrants who come from uh, zones which are conflict far, far away. So they will uh, assimilate into American society far more easily and far more securely than other immigrants. So legalize the Im immigration policies in a good way, in a systematic way. That is what calls, you know, that is called harnessing human potential and which we are lacking because we are allowing uh, uh, unfiltered um, immigration. So you're getting skilled laborers, you're getting a, a labor force to fill the uh, jobs for our country that will bring in more income. It's not going to eat your job. So once the government understands this uh, circle, Jay, that uh, North America, South America, it is America. When you, when you talk of that integrity, it will bring a, you know, it will bring a more... Uh, relaxed, calm atmosphere, and it will bring integrity into this relationship between these two continents, because why? You're connected by a, a cord, <laughs> and that cord is very important, Jay. China coming in, I'll tell you, uh, Latin American nations are very fragile, and uh, economics, inflation hurts them suddenly. It doesn't give any warning. So you have a basket full of uh, money, which will buy you one loaf of bread. That kind of situation happens so many times. You have seen it over the years develop in so many nations when people have this huge inflation, bankruptcy. What do they do? They go to the International Monetary Fund. They go to these World Bank uh, um, and other institutions and ask for loans. When they can't pay it, they get into structural borrowing so, and they get into a debt trap. Who comes to help check? Who comes to mortgage their ports? Who comes to mortgage their land? China comes in. That is how they, they um, what do you say, drill themselves into the fabric of any country. We see uh, they have bought large scale uh, con <laughs> the continent of Africa. Like you, they are into mining, they're into uh, every road, they're everywhere. They're trying to do the same thing in Latin America. When the United States can afford to give $40 billion to Ukraine, can't we invest at least $1 billion in Latin America? <laughs> you know, terrible what you're describing. Let's look at the map one more time. So as you <laughs> said, Rupmati, Brazil is huge. Look at the size of it. It's way bigger than the U.S. It has enormous resources. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that I recall that the that there's iron ore uh, somewhere in the northwest of the country, um, and that iron ore is very valuable for China, and yeah. China has uh, entered into agreements with Brazil to buy the iron ore. But it gets worse. China has also um, invested in steel factories, so it is using the iron ore that it has, uh, you know, acquired from Brazil 
uh, to build steel, to manufacture steel, and though then it imports the steel, where do you think? Back to China. So that's the kind of thing that, sh that shows us up. And there are a lot of other examples in that. And that, that keeps Brazil going, that kind of thing, to take the resources, including oil. There's oil all over uh, Latin America. I, mean, I can't say which countries, but it's an exporter of oil, and it exports oil to the U.S. Why don't we actually do what China does, just as you suggest, uh, and, and invest in, in these projects, invest in developing resources? And I guess the, the thing I would ask you, though, looking at the map, is where do we start? We're talking about a continent that's huge, way bigger than North America. And where do you start? Do you, do you start with the countries that are more democratic? Do you start with the countries that are less democratic? You mentioned a moment ago that we had imposed sanctions on a number of these countries because we didn't feel they were democratic. And, and that freezes out the possibility of dealing with them later. It doesn't help. Sanctions, you can quote me, sanctions don't help. So the question is, who do we deal with? The dictators, um, the communists, uh, the fascists, um, the democracies, where do we start? Where do we begin building better relationships in this map of Latin America? Jay, when we talk about these countries, Jay, we really have to go uh, uh, superficial in politics and uh, below the layers in infrastructure. That is the kind of two-pronged policy that we have to have for Latin America, Jay. We have to remove the spectacle of democratic values when we deal with Latin America because you know what has happened to uh, Latin America? These countries have developed very uh, individualistically. They don't follow set patterns. They are different from, Brazil is different from what Argentina is. We think it all comes under one umbrella, but they have different cultures. They have different values. They have different uh, uh, left-right policies. They don't, that doesn't matter for them. For them, it is subsistence living, Jay. They are agrarian economies uh, as a whole. They have untapped resources in the mountains and the sands and the uh, forests. So. For them, their economy is very, very different from what we see in developed countries, in developing countries. Um, in our developed countries, we have industries. In developing countries, we have populations and striving for an industrial force. Here it is uh, mostly, Jay, they're still at basic levels. And uh, can you believe it? When each country is satisfied with only 20 million, I think that is the uh, salary of a Hollywood actor, for one uh, <laughs> one movie, uh, I think Robert Downey Jr. was paid six hundred and uh, how many seventy million? Uh, what is that? Around six sixty-seven million dollars for his role. So think about how much they can um, put effort into each country. Maybe we cannot have relations with all the countries. Think about the big ones. How can you develop BRICS when Brazil is joined BRICS? See the kind of isolation that, uh, or secessionist uh, um, attitude that Brazil has to go and rather join BRICS rather than any other, because nobody's taking them. Are they taking them in the G7, G, whatever? They go and join BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. The countries which cannot sit in the forum for G8 have gone and formed their own bloc. Today, the BRICS has a bigger GDP than all the G8 uh, countries combined. So, Jay, you have to consider, you have to have flexibility in your policies. That is the uh, key thing in international politics. And Latin America commands that kind of flexibility. If you deal with Peru, you cannot ignore, you, they, they are generally, I'll tell you, Jay, they are united. Because when, in the 2022 Economic Forum, when um, they were barred from attending uh, this Cuba and everybody, Barbados, um, Bolivia, they came up and spoke that why they should not be allowed. Why are they not being allowed? So why to have these voices of dissent when we are trying to from, form free trade agreements? Free trade agreements irrespective. Latin America with North America. This is the kind of uh, relaxed mode uh, we should strive for, Jay. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I was sad to see that Trump uh, turned his back on Cuba. 
Um, mm. Obama, you know, uh, dropped the sanctions and uh, made, made friends with them. And all of a sudden there was trade and tourism and what have you. As soon as Trump gets into office, he's, he turns his back on them and they become, you know, pariah again. Um, this is exactly the wrong way to go. We, we have to find a way to make, to make um, friendly relations. And one of those things I, I suggest, Rupmati, and I like your reaction to this, is to encourage American investors to invest, mm -hmm. to yes. build companies, to hire labor, um, to mm, do agriculture and resources of all kinds, and to connect up uh, on a trade basis, to connect up on a manufacturing basis, manufacture components, you know, anything and everything, and to invest down there and build things down there. And in order to do that, um, you know, you're going to have certain issues with the local governments. Maybe there'll be corruption. Um, there'll, be, mm, there'll be arguments with the local governments, especially if they don't like the U.S. much. Um, but on the other hand, the U.S. can help. The U.S. can back those investors. The U.S. can give those investors uh, incentives of one kind or another and have them go down there. And I think uh, this sort of thing leads to better economies, and better economies leads to less gangs, less drugs, less violence, less possibility of more revolutions and disruptions. Um, so, you know, the answer to the question we're posing here today, uh, and the question is, are we paying enough attention to Latin America? The answer is absolutely not. You know, we have all these other issues going on around in the world, and we can't seem to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, but this is very important, or we will find um, China and Russia on our doorstep in every which way, and we will continue to lose uh, world influence and um, hegemony in, in our own backyard. Your thoughts about how we can stop the madness and make friends. Yeah, Jay, you are so, every point of yours was so correct in this, because, Jay, we are in a rat race with China. Because if we don't reach the post, they are already, you know, striving. They don't, we, at least there's a coherence of proximity, location, culture, there is a little bit of affinity we have with Latin America. But China doesn't know the language. Different, totally different. But what they, they focus on, they focus on just economics, raw materials, cheap oil, cheap labor, they don't even blink, Jay. They don't have any other consideration other than profit and uh, uh, their, their business and uh, just, uh, what do you say? It's a, a single, a singular type of uh, loci that they function on, Jay. And that is what we like. We try to consider 10 things before we come down to conclusions. And we are wasting our time. And wasting time means, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the fields of Bolivia are already sold, leased out for 100 years. Uh, locals keep on crying, keep on putting placards, but they are sold. To whom? To China. So uh, this kind of uh, interventionist policy that China has is not political. We kept on concentrating on political intervention. They have concentrated on... Uh, <laughs> economic intervention. So that's the difference we have in this. And Jay, surprisingly, European Union also keeps Latin America, they are they are also waking up to the reality that Latin America needs to be concentrated on. So if Europe at such a distance, China at such a distance are thinking of Latin America, why shouldn't the United States also have Latin America as a priority in foreign policy, in infrastructure development as a base for our manufacturing units. You know, take one country which has maximum uh, potential and develop it. That is the kind of, and uh, say, if you want to control the drugs, Jay, it has been a very big problem. You have to bring in a solidarity with the nations. You can't have divisions and then expect crime to be solved. Uh, the, the crime has to be solved with solidarity with the nations, with the... Uh, security forces, and that's how we can stop these drugs coming into U.S. borders. So looking at the map one more time, my understanding is that some of these countries are better than other of these countries. Some of them are more dangerous. Some of them are, have you know, bad governments one way or another and disenchanted people. I mean, we know that from the newspaper 
the raw meat stories about uh, Venezuela. And Venezuela is on the Caribbean. Venezuela is north of Brazil. Venice is, is close to Central America. Um, and yet, um, you know, we could pay attention. They're relatively close to us. They're not, you can see on the map that they're not far from the United oh. States, from Cuba, from all the countries in Central America, from the Panama Canal. Uh, yes. And yet Venezuela is very problematic. But we could make Venezuela um, a kind of, um, you know, uh, an example. Likewise, and I'm not saying that it's a, the greatest country in Latin America. It is not. Uruguay, however, has a very low, relative to the others, crime rate. Yes. Uruguay is a, is a relatively middle class, successful company. And, I, and I've seen movies made in Uruguay, art, entertainment, that is of interest to the United States and to the United States market. I haven't seen anything much come out of Venezuela like that. Um, oh. And then you have other countries that are successful. Costa Rica, that's, well, like Costa Rica is more like Central America. Um, but the point about Costa Rica is a lot of Americans live there, retire there. It is a, it's a relatively successful country. Sure, they have a little crime, maybe a lot, but not as much as some of the others. And so what I'm saying, I think, is that we ought to take one or two, maybe three of them, and bend over backward to be close with them. Offer them special immigration status. Offer them special investment status show the world, and particularly other countries in Latin America, that the U.S. knows how to take care of its friends. And if we do that and make them successful, um, then other countries in Latin America, other leaders in Latin America would say, well, that's a lot better than sanctions. We ought to try to be like them. And so I mean, what I'm saying is that foreign policy doesn't, you know, take a broad brush and, and brush the whole continent. We focus on countries that are more likely to be friendly with us and to be the object of good, good policy and good investment. Your thoughts? Our security blanket reaches out over to Europe. They survive, the European Union survives on the US security blanket. But to extend uh, economic and security uh, blanket in the own backyard will be beneficial to the United States itself, Jay. Anything south of the United States of America is considered Latin America. So, uh, uh, and Jay, we all know during electoral politics how the Hispanic and uh, Latin American communities would to the hilt. After the elections, they are forgotten for four years and again when the round comes for re-election, again they are catered to. So this kind of negligence and then, uh, you know, pampering is just isolating them it gives them those uh, highs and throws which uh, frustrate them they are in a state of frustration and that frustration is not you know you have an angry family member running around in your house <laughs> it, it it disturbs the whole sanctity of the house that is the kind of uh, uh, influence that latin america has on the us it is home it is the united states home because it's an entire continent which is still connected nobody's gone far away there is always a connectivity, and that connectivity has to be, uh, what do you say, nurtured, Jay. Uh, and for it's going to just be simply beneficial to the United States itself in terms of good human resources. You don't have to depend on outside uh, labor force. Uh, giving them good education will mean you are having skilled laborers, skilled and educated people who will be coming into the country. Any investment in Latin America will not go to waste. It's, it's surrounded by water. It's like an island continent. It's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to come back into the US. So uh, if China thinks that they can come across the uh, uh, ocean and you know, uh, develop and infiltrate into Latin America, why the United States should fall behind? Just on political considerations? Absolutely, teach them the values of democracy because we always know this, this is a favorite quote of ours, Jay, that democ two democratic states don't go to war together. So it's always good to nurture democracy. Well said, Rupmati, such wisdom. We ought to make you the, uh, the Secretary <laughs> of State, as I made you in the last show. Anyway, we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks to everyone for watching. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.